You struggle to keep going, trying to escape it. But if you think there's no way out, you're living in a private nightmare of your own creation. That's what happens when you put off doing your taxes to the last minute. Wake up and do something about it. File now, file accurately, and make your taxes less taxing. It was a feeling started long ago, one bleak and winter morn. When the call went out for volunteers in a nation being born. No sunshine patriot speeches, no summer soldiers songs. Or the special men who'd pay the price to keep the country strong. When we were needed, we were there. We were there when we were needed, we were there. No, it wasn't always easy, it wasn't always fair. But when freedom called, we answered, we were there. If you want to find out who we are, just ask us where we've been. From the frozen fields of Valley Forge to the trail called Ho Chi Minh. Through the glory and the sacrifice, we do our job each day. We're citizens and soldiers and army all the way. When we were needed, we were there. We were there when we were needed, we were there. Though it wasn't always easy, it wasn't always fair. But when freedom called, we had in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Until one week ago, we were much like any other teaching order. That is when Sister Beth Trail came to join us. Things were never quite the same after that. You see, Sister Beth Trail flies. Oh, not in an airplane. She only weighs 90 pounds, and she just flies. It's time for What's Cooking with Sarah Long. Hello, come join me in my kitchen. If you're lactose intolerant or if you know someone that is, then you'll want to grab a pen right now so that you can write for this recipe leaflet. It's called Dairy Recipes for the Lactose Intolerant. Being lactose intolerant doesn't mean the end of enjoying the taste the variety, the convenience, and the nutritional attributes of dairy products. Current research indicates most individuals diagnosed as lactose intolerant can consume dairy foods without any discomfort if they follow a few practical tips which are listed in this leaflet. One of those tips is to choose whole milk or chocolate milk, either of these are more slowly digested, and a good aged cheese, such as the cheddar cheese you see here. Aged cheese contains very little lactose. There are also lactose-reduced milks available in the dairy case, and the recipe I'm using today calls for lactose-reduced milk. It's for a cheese vegetable chowder, a good way to chase away the winter's chill. To make this easy chowder, you'll need probably a three-quart saucepan, or I'm using a real large skillet in which I've melted one stick of butter. To that, we're going to add two cups of chopped cabbage. This is finely chopped fresh cabbage. One cup each of the following. We have one cup of sliced onion, thin slices, there's one cup of sliced celery, 
There's one cup of green peas or English peas, and you can tell by looking at those that those are frozen peas. I like to keep a bag of frozen peas in the freezer just for using in soups and chowders. And then one cup of thinly sliced carrots. And we need to let this saute, this mixture saute in the butter just until all the vegetables are tender. While we're giving the vegetables a chance to saute for just a few minutes, why don't you take this opportunity to write for your free copy of the recipe leaflet. Be sure and send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Dairy Recipes for the Lactose Intolerant, to the Southeast Dairy Association, that's Post Office Box 87247, Atlanta, Georgia, and the zip code is 30337. Now we'll add the other ingredients I have here, a can of cream style corn. This is a 16 ounce size can of cream style corn that comes either in yellow or white, and I've chosen the yellow corn. And I'm going to add two and one half cups of milk just gradually to this mixture. And as I said just a moment ago, this is the lactose reduced milk. All the milk. And then we have three seasonings, one teaspoon of salt, one fourth teaspoon of thyme, and one eighth teaspoon of pepper. Mix this in and let the soup simmer for a while until the flavors blend. Then just right before serving, stir in two and a half cups of shredded cheddar cheese. You'll love this hearty, warming, and filling chowder recipe, which you're sure to enjoy often during these cold days. The recipe makes two quarts, and one cup only has 352 calories. The recipes are wonderful that are in the leaflet. They're not just for the people that are lactose intolerant. Be sure and send us a self address stamped envelope for your copy. Happy cooking. This has been Once Cooking with Sarah Long, home economist for the Southeast Dairy Association. Japanese language news, features, and commercials weekday mornings at 7.30 a.m. here on TV69. Welcome back. Seeing a lack of access to quality literature relating to the black experience, publisher Janice Adams, with some help I started Harambi, the book club for African American families and friends. We welcome Janice Adams to this segment of Community. Janice, Hi. thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Now this story starts out, we were saying, I was saying it's a great idea, but the story starts out when you have your own publishing business, Backpacks International. Uh -huh. And in the course of that, looking for literature for your own family, you found well, a lack of it. Yeah, actually Backpacks is a publishing company I started um, for young people's materials, just general market young people's materials. Um, that was begun out of a frustration of not seeing really accurate worldview, in other words, multicultural materials for children. Then, after I started Backpacks, um, I had the opportunity, and so a lifelong frustration with trying to find um, black-oriented or black interest materials led me to founding Harambe, then, the book club. The issue was access, the issue was information, getting books into print, keeping books in print, all of that. Now, you're saying in, in the notes, are, we've been deprived and there's some kind of problem with the viability of black novels or black writing out there. They don't think there's a market for well, it or we don't read or something. You know, what well, it? we've all heard those terrible stereotypes and basically I can now say that um, not only what I've known and felt all along but with, you know, documented proof that anybody who says that is not informed. 
In other words, when, when I wanted to start the book club, part of the research and development phase, I did a questionnaire and um, just went to people all over the country. Actually, the first series we did w was right here in Atlanta, but um, of just studying black reading and book buying habits. And literally, nobody had ever done such a survey or a study before. So when we started here, we did it in cooperation last year with the Black Family Reunions, and we went to all the five cities of the reunion, Atlanta, Washington, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, LA. When we were here, the first one, within the first five hours, 677 people filled out this questionnaire and we said wow what is going on so and we weren't asking anybody do you want to join the book club we just wanted to know what their reading and book buying habits were and at one point there were so many people that I went over and I said why are you filling out this questionnaire we haven't promised you a trip anywhere or anything like that and literally people said because nobody asks us anything and then the research was borne out in the other cities as we travel along. So we were kind of commanded into existence by the demand of, of people that we met along the way. And, and I was reading that there's only 100 black bookstores Roughly here? Roughly 100 black-oriented bookstores in the, in the country. I mean, you're privileged in Atlanta ha to have, I know the Shrine of the Black Madonna, bookshop and there's an there are another one or two that you have here mm -hmm. but basically when you go around the country outside of the the nuclear black community it's like DC Atlanta yes but but even there outside of the the tight lit knit center of the community itself like you've got a good bookstore in Harlem and you've got a good one in Bed-Stuy you basically do not find black market bookstores mm -hmm. um, there is another one in in Denver you know I mean but they're really very spread out so that if here I've come to Atlanta today I'm staying in a hotel if I just go browsing up and down the street it's doubtful that I'm going to find a range of black interest books and the point that I like to make to non-black people as well as as um, people who are particularly involved in the education of young black people is that it is sure you can say I've gone to the bookstore well aren't you interested in anything else but that is diametrically opposed to what retailing is about when you go into a store you're supposed to feel as though everything is out there for you and you just have to sift your way through and whatever you want is there we on the other hand go into a store and we're asked to make sure that we submerge our impulse to know about ourselves as much as possible mm -hmm. and then maybe you can now start to pursue your interest if it's in flowers don't plan to find any in an African flower or something like that you just won't find it well, you, the publishers the big houses you're finding that with your project here now Harambe you're getting a lot of help from them well yeah they're very interested because essentially every market that we have there's nothing magic about a market somebody has to nurture it and nourish it along the way and and say let's advertise to this community and let's do shows it's, like this I mean, one it's, it's the craziest thing it's, it's like black films that they don't think sure. anyone's out there to watch them black and I know a lot of people who are reading Tony Morrison's books not not non-black people who are reading those books and really enjoying Tony Morrison Alice Walker absolutely no reason not to the point is that you have well we know within our communities there is a different way to market to the black community not a right way or a wrong way when when marketing um, and market research was developed it was basically housed and structured on a non-black community and so they found the way people in their communities moved and what they would respond to most etc and that became the answer to how do you market books well we also have a community it moves it does things but probably in a slightly different way and there's a different way to get to it they tried to move some of their techniques to the black community didn't work and then said blacks don't read it's far from true mm -hmm. so for 1995 mm -hmm. if I send my little thing off to Harambe what will happen what will I get? for 1995 as a membership fee to Harambe you get 
what I call a fantastic safari into Afro Americana, not Afro, but Afro Americana. That's a new phrase. I want you to tell us you know, what that I is. I just like the phrase because it meant, well, you have Americana, mm -hmm. and so you have Afro Americana. And it just meant the world of, of African descent in the Americas, that's all. Um, and, and that means from in, in the editorial that I've written for the first catalog, I've written from Joplin to Jamaica to Johannesburg. So <laughs> Joplin, Missouri, meaning Excellent. Langston Hughes, <laughs> Jamaica for the Caribbean, and Johannesburg, because of course we're featuring things on, on South Africa, particularly at this time, mm -hmm. for the African world in general. Okay. Oh, that's, that was the quarterly magazine that you were talking well, about? Well, let's talk about what 1995 buys you specifically. Okay. It's membership in the club, which means that you have regular announcements, and I want to tell you about that further. As well, part of that is you receive one free book, um, and then you receive one year's free subscription to the quarterly magazine, which, which will be beginning this summer because we realized that you didn't just open like a book review section and get all the information that you needed on these books. Um, the, the catalogs, however, I find fun because the children's one has been done in a gorgeous full color poster of beautiful black children's faces with the books on there so that not only do they see themselves but they see what something for them. The adult one has been done in the form of a calendar, a black history calendar, so that there is an event for every day, a day for a book for every day, and a good reason for every book. Um, and right here, I like to mention the April 11th one is the founding of Spellman, but it's also the day that we put. Tina Ance's um, baby of the family, who I hear visited you a while ago, because two Spelman graduates united for that particular book. Mm -hmm. Burnett Honeywood doing the art, oh, and right. Tina Ansa, who is whose novel it really is. So we've tied things in that way, and it's kind of fun. Okay. All right. Now that oh, now you have the family book fair. Family Book Fair, once again, is something that we're doing as a service kind of thing on, on a very structured basis where we do book fairs. We'll be doing five of them this summer at the Five Black Family Reunion, so we'll do one here in Atlanta when Black Family Reunion comes back. We've been invited to and, and we're glad to do it. It's something like, you know, as I'm sitting here looking at something, this is something that should have been around a long time ago. And you, you have some pretty um, uh, famous friends, I guess, in the publishing and editorial business who helped you kick off around this. A lot of people wanted to see this thing happen. And so when I began to talk about it and, and say, look, this needs to be done and we need this opportunity, et cetera, people said, of course it makes sense. But it just hadn't been done before. I mean, the if you look at something like Book of the Month Club, it was started when there were no bookstores and all the shopping malls and you didn't just walk around and the United States in the 30s was much more rural and all of that. That's the genesis of that. Well, for blacks, it's almost the same thing. It's not that we're removed from the, the mall and the greening of America. It's just that our needs aren't still service, so the idea of having a direct mail component, a book club, really is a good one now to have access, to get the information, enhanced awareness. So name some of the authors. We were talking about before I was saying it. Oh, I remember growing up with people, uh, authors like Richard Wright, oh, uh, wonderful. James Baldwin, and now I kind They're of They're both feel on because this year, actually, I really wanted to have Richard Wright on because this year is the 50th anniversary of Native Son. It was um, published in February of 1940. Um, so Native Son is included, and in the audio tape version, we also have Black Boy right. I'll see available. You. Uh huh. Um, Jimmy Baldwin, James Baldwin's series, a series of his books have just been brought back out, and so we featured that co that collection from Amen Corner to Price of the Ticket to um, Nobody Knows My Name, that whole range. Um, so there are those that we've all 
heard about for all these years and the Langston Hughes's, but then on the other spectrum, there are some brand new authors, or relatively, like Tina Ansa, whose first book, Baby of the Family, this is. is um, yes. Itabari and Jerry was on um, the Today Show recently for her book, Every Goodbye Ain't Gone. She's on our list. J. California Cooper, as well, Al Young, who a lot of people knew um, years ago, has just come out with his first book in about eight years, and that book is on the list. And um, Oh, it's uh, a wonderful you, range. The, are we seeing a, another Negro renaissance as far as black writing is concerned now? I, I think, think it's more... No, I would like to look at it a different way. I know what you mean by the renaissance, but I hate the idea that we come in and out of vogue. I think what we have now is what we've always had. We really don't go any place. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, we seize the opportunity and say, look, this didn't work when we believed that it would be done another way before. We must now do the marketing and the visualization, the distribution ourselves. That dollar must circle three times in our own community before it leaves. Mm -hmm. That's what, what is happening now. But one thing that I do find to be an interesting trend is that there are a group of novels that are coming out that are very family oriented from Melvin Dixon's um, Trouble the Water, which is about his family story. And then there's another, um, there are a lot of authors, even we mentioned Baby of the Family, which is a novel that takes place in a family. And Jerry's novel, or well, started as a novel, but is definitely a um, nonfiction now was her search to find out how her grandfather died in very mysterious circumstances and she found out that he was quote a rabble rouser in the south at a certain point and so it wasn't just a plain hit and run accident there was a little bit more to it than that and but the range is just it's we're writing more about ourselves. We're, we're choosing to define ourselves in slightly different ways. I think that what's happening also is that we are now writing more to ourselves rather than through ourselves to somebody mm -hmm. else. Yeah, exactly. You know. know. Good point. Um, and so there's a certain depth. And I think the Cosby Show actually should be put there too for, for a certain turning point that it signaled mm -hmm. that one could be a black person, demonstrate a black life and a black lifestyle of the many black lifestyles that there actually are, mm -hmm. but not have to act as though just for the camera or just for the book, every morning you get up and before you brush your teeth you say, I am black. And then you go to the mirror and you say, now I am black. No, you just live from day to day, but there are a lot of different things that hit you. You brought up the Cos Cosby aspect, and that was something I was thinking. Do you anticipate Harambe getting into films, stuff like Oscar Misha or um, Stormy Well, Wayne I mean, I would love, one of the things that, that um, the book club represents is possibility. For example, a lot of things have come into print and gone out too fast. Other things have never been printed or never been packaged at all um, into either videotape format or audio tape format or even book format. One of the reasons is sheer economics. If people are saying that there is no solid market there, then they're so saying that they for. have nothing to feed. The book club is really just a means of distribution, and it helps to bring that market together so that there is. And they do try to lay that light. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm so in love with Spike Lee, because uh -huh. do the right thing. Nobody wants to see black He's movies. He's brilliant, but too, in terms of his But that last film, the discussion that it started, yes, not but just course. black, between with everyone, it, you have to. Well, I think what he's done in an American context where, in general, a lot of, with America's art form being so owned by the dollar, you have this, this n need to make everything mass-oriented which means that a lot of the individualized substance is taken out, the drive to so-called be as inoffensive as possible, but we all know that that is very, very limited in terms of what it means to be inoffensive, because I happen to think that being um, 
negated, being ignored is very offensive. <laughs> but um, in, in general, what Spike Lee has done is to call back into effect the art, the conscience of the artist and what art is really exactly. about. Exactly. Now, so that bearing the sense, it's not a black thing, it's not a white thing, it's art. Yeah. I mean, he decided to speak as an artist. And basically, with the economic structure that we have, the voice of the artist as an artist, I mean, I've never heard anything as ridiculous as, as popular music, especially what it has done to rap, which when, you know, like the last poets of, of the late know. 60s yes. and 70s, which really began the rap um, craze, they were speaking about some very, very important things that were instructive to young people in their community. They weren't, we love you, you love me, we love each other, and then we love some more, and then we don't love anymore, and all that. They weren't doing that. They were dealing with the critical issues of life in their community. They were giving each other information on how to survive. They were protecting each other. That was taken away by the music industry's drive to put this other kind of thing on top of them in the name of commercialization. Mm -hmm. And those young kids need that. They are just as vulnerable as a bigger Thomas was 50 years ago. And their underpinnings have been taken away from them. Mm -hmm that rap music needs to be given back to them for what it really was all along. I think a lot of artists are, are staying true to it, but as you say, a lot of people like to dilute it and you know, put it in all kinds of different forms. And But it is good that it's out there. I think the individual artist is true. I mean, you have, but every artist cannot afford the sacrifices. It's not that they're not willing to make it. Mm -hmm. They cannot all afford it. I mean, we have some phenomenal authors out here, poets like a Sonia Sanchez, who are not widely known because Sonia has been adamant over the years about what she will and will not say and what she will and will not do. And it's cost her publishing contracts. And that mainstream sales. acceptance. Yes, it has. It should not, um, but it has. S it's everybody can't do it whatever the reason is and I don't think we need to condemn those who cannot we need to see if we can pull each other in and strengthen each other and then economically support those of us who say I would like to do something that may take a little bit more sacrifice but then we have to say hey here's the means for you to do it let's support you because you're doing it for us uh, there, there's a number an 800 number or for information well to on. join the book club which I'd love people to do there is an 800 number do you want me to give yes, it now I'll have it up on the screen anyway okay it's 800-999-5721 and I'll say it slower 999-5721 Janice Adams, I want to thank you for coming in and thank you thank for you. coming up with Harambee and Idea, whose time has definitely come. Thank you. I'd like to thank Janice Adams and the rest of our guests for visiting with us today. I'm Ben Jonathan. Once again, as always, reminding you to continue to watch your community grow in community, and we'll see you tomorrow. This program has been provided as a public service by WBEU TV 69 Atlanta.